Got your own microphone, Ronnie. Yours is fully charged, don't worry. <laughs> um, we'll obviously have a look ahead to the weekend very shortly, Sharpie, but there's just nothing like scoring a goal in a Merseyside derby. No, definitely not. I think it's something you'll always be remembered for, uh, especially if it's a winning goal. But uh, a fantastic occasions. You know, when I was coming down from from Scotland, I'd obviously grown up with the Rangers Celtic derby, and uh, I didn't think there was anything like it. Unfortunately, I didn't play in that, but uh, you know, I went to uh, a lot of the games. They were unbelievable. Uh, so when I came down to to Merseyside, and everybody was saying, "Oh, we to hear the derby, we to play in the derby. It's fantastic." I'm thinking. Oh, it can't be better than that one. But that week, the first week uh, leading up to the derby, uh, I didn't realise I had so many relatives in Liverpool, cousins and uncles and aunties who were wanting tickets. Uh, so the phone was uh, going constantly. But the actual game itself was was more than expected. It was absolutely fantastic. Walking down the tunnel at Goodison and then up the stairs, and then the noise when it hits you at the top is it's incredible. You know, even though I'm not from this part of the world, uh, it was something that pff, the hairs in the back of your neck stood up, uh, stood up. Sorry, and for the first 10, 15 minutes, you couldn't hear your teammates shouting at you. Uh, so it was a fantastic experience. Uh, as to like Stephen Naismith and people have played in, in Glasgow derbies, and you know they played in Merseyside derbies as well. And I tell you what, there's not a lot in it. Ronnie, you grew up with the Merseyside derby. You must have been watching Merseyside derbies more or less as soon as you could walk. Well, a bit like Sharpie, I mean, um, it, there's nothing like it. I mean, my dad and my granddad used to take me. I had a season ticket in Bullens Road. And I can remember every one of them. I mean, one of the best ones was when Bowley scored against Liverpool um, in the Cup. Uh, I was about a, you know, I, I, I don't know how old I was, but I mean, um, you, you never forget moments like that. And then, you know, any you know young blue noses listening or watching this, uh, your dream is to play for the club you love. And, uh, you know, whether it's... Um, you know, what age you play or, or you go out there. I mean, I mean, it's just a fantastic occasion. You're not just playing for yourself, you're playing for your family, your friends. And I think when you actually, you know, get out there and you think, oh, I used to watch these and I'm actually playing on, you know, the beloved turf and uh, you get out there. There's nothing like it. And as I say, you know, Graham's saying about Celtic Rangers, I mean, I'll, I'll put Everton Liverpool up against anybody and down the years, you know, we've just seen a few clips. I think here uh, some fa fantastic players have uh, played for the club down the years and, you know, you know, long may continue that uh, we, we have a, you know, a good club and a, a history and a tradition that, that you know, we've been over 100 odd years. That's uh, that FA Cup tie when Borley scored the winner, that was screened, wasn't it? There was as many people at Anfield as there was at Goodison. Well, uh, we, as you know, we've done the Alan Ball tribute and we had it on the screens and uh, it was the most watched. It was over 100 odd thousand because Anfield, obviously, as you say, with the screens, the, cr the screens actually blew down at Anfield. So they can't even do that right, can they? Um, but Paul used to always remind me, uh, as you know, not, not just himself, but but I think anybody, you know, Lee Carsey will tell you later, Snods, um, you know, Sharpie's got happy memories. But once you play for the club and you're playing a derby, it's just it's just there for the rest of your life. When you made your Merseyside derby debut, Sharpie, what, what was it like on the morning of the game? What was it like the night before? Well, as I said, that w the whole week running up to it was, was crazy. You know, you had people... Uh, coming to Belfield, you know, wanting tickets from me, you know, you were hiding from people who were wanting tickets from me, and it was just constant, you know. It's true what they say, when the, when the fixture lists come out, you know, as players, you have a look at the fixture list and you pick out the best fixtures, and, and obviously the best fixture was was Liverpool, when were the derbies, wh who were we playing over New Year, you know, when did they play Manchester United? So as soon as the fixtures came out and you knew when the date was, it was in the back of your mind, but as the game... If you played on the Saturday and it was the following Saturday game, once the Saturday game had finished, come Monday morning, we had a like a session, but not geared towards the Saturday. But as soon as you come in on the Tuesday, everything was geared towards playing Liverpool on the Saturday. Uh, Howard Kendall was was a great believer in, in, in training with the balls. Uh, the first Merseyside derby, uh, it wasn't really a great one because we got beat 3-1, but I managed to score. Uh, so after three minutes, after three minutes, yeah, it was incredible. They had so much about it, and I thought this is a piece of cake. You can score in three minutes. Just unfortunately, I wish I had that same record. You know, I think thirty games I played against Liverpool, but no, they're fantastic occasions. The players all look forward to them, and I know it's it's always good to have a scouser in the dressing room. You know, and I think you know you've got Aussie in there and Hibbo in there at the moment. Uh, you know, they they can tell the foreign lads, you know, what what this means. 
you know, sometimes you get foreign lads coming over and playing and they've got no idea what it means to the, to the families and people going to work and everything else. But the likes of a couple of scouts is in there, you know, they'll make sure they know. And the backroom staff as well, Jimmy Comer, uh, Tony Sage, Jimmy Martin, they'll be into the boys' ribs this week saying, you know, how important this game is. We need to bounce back. We need to get a result. This is really important for us. Uh, that's good. Somebody else coming in? Yeah. <laughs> the first fine of the night yes. <laughs> goes to that young lady. Yeah, no, but that's what it's, it's a great build-up. It's a really, really good build-up all during the week. And then come the Saturday morning, you can't wait. To, you know, you, you can't wait to get to the ground, sit down, get your, your kit on. In those days, and when we first started, Ronnie was probably the same. We didn't go on the pitch for a warm-up. We used to warm up in the dressing room. So your first sight of the crowd was when you came up that tunnel. So it's an incredible atmosphere, incredible experience, and you know one that you know I, I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed playing in them. I hate watching them, and certainly I haven't go over to the other place on Saturday. It's it's a hard, it's a hard task to go over there. Ronnie will be in there as well, and it's uh, you're right in the uh, the bear pit in there, and it's really difficult. But you can't have any influence in them here, so I prefer playing in them than I do watching them. Sharpie just touched on the amount of new friends he suddenly found during Derby Week, and Sharpie's from Glasgow. You must have been absolutely peppered for tickets. Well, uh, you ended up, as Sharpie said, you, we never used to have a warm-up. I think I used to put my kit on about two minutes to three. You know, you've, you've got half the main stand as your family, your friends, your relatives. You've got, I don't know how many from, from Iton, West Derby, you know, everywhere, and people who you thought hated you um, are your best mate. But, uh, but that's part of it. I mean, you, you know, the old build-up. You know, for that week, you go to the corner shop, the lady, you know, we've got a daily minute, and what are we getting on Saturday, Ronnie? How's my boys going to do? And, and th you know, th that sort of all the time, that's what it's about. And, you know, once the, the last game goes by, the derby's uh, the next one up, you, you start thinking about it. And, there's, um, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, to be honest, because, you know, they're that passionate about it. If you try to switch off or take it away for a couple of days and just play the game, someone will still say to you, you know, well, it doesn't matter where you go, you know, how are we going to get on Saturday? But, um, you know, I think uh, you wouldn't have any any difference. I mean, you know, we are a passionate club and the support is fantastic. I mean, not just touching on the Swansea game. I mean, you've got like two and a half thousand supporters down there on a wet Tuesday night. And we sell the allocation week in and week out, which is, you know, just uh, shows you what a following and, and what a passion we have got for the club. But, you know, derby games, I, th I think, I don't know in your day, Gray, when you could actually, you know, virtually take the Anfield Road and... I mean, I used to love it, you know, and I think you lose a little bit slightly where we only get a couple of thousand tickets. I mean, I remember coming out there and you just turn to your left, the noise is unbelievable. And it's all blue and it's, you know, it's a feeling that just, you know, raises you. And I think, um, you, you know, a lot of the sort of the foreign lads, they'll know on Saturday if it's going to be their first derby or, or get out there because, again, it's just, uh, it's just uplifting. It's a bit scary maybe at times, but... All you want to do is get out there, get that whistle blows, and, and, and obviously try and do the best you can for the club. Your John's a very good friend of mine, as you know, and I can imagine when the fixtures came out, if Everton were home to Liverpool at the end of April, he'd put the touch in at the beginning of August for his tickets, wouldn't he? he he's in there. I mean, <laughs> you know, as soon as it comes out, uh, I just want the, the six this time, lad. And uh, you think to yourself, you know, you, you, you've got four season tickets yourself. But, uh, but as I say, I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I, I just hope I really do on Saturday we... We go out there and, and, and give it our own. Because, you, you know, the, the way the papers, it's all doom and gloom. I mean, we're not as bad as, as everyone's trying to make out. And I just think, you know, I remember back into the, in the 60s when a virtual Everton Reserve team went to Manfield and won 4-0. So, you know, let, let's be positive about it. Let's say, look, there's nothing you can do about the past. And, and again, individual errors maybe have let us down slightly. But I think we can go there and, and really have a go with them on Saturday. And I think without a shadow of a doubt, if we can keep a clean sheet, we, we'll beat them Saturday. Let's hope so, Graham. Neither side going into the 223rd Merseyside derby in the greatest of form, but they do say that the form book doesn't matter one jot. Let's hope so. Yeah, definitely. I think you know. I think our, our main worry is conceding goals, but I think that's Liverpool's worry as well. You know, they're conceding goals. Uh, they've lost whatever you thought of them. A world-class player in Suarez. Sturridge is out injured, so they look as if they're struggling there. They brought in, you know, the quiet lad Balotelli. Uh, Hopefully, it upsets the apple cart over there. But no, they've got the problems. You know, but it's a derby game. You know, I think when we when I first started at Everton and Liverpool were top of the tree and, and winning things right, left, and centre, we kind of went over there with like an inferiority complex, thinking, oh, we're going over to Liverpool. 
that's not the case. That that's gone. That myth's gone now. You know, and you know you can go over there uh, as people have proven in the past and go and get a result. It's been a long time since since we last won over there. So we're due one. Uh, can we do it? Of course we can. I just like to think that as a team we start better than what we did last year. You know, the, uh, I think we got caught in the headlights a little bit. Uh, you know, we conceded four goals. It could have been a lot more. Uh, so I hope, you know, that we, we, we've learned our lesson and we're a little bit more solid. As I said, they've lost a little bit of firepower. I think most of our players will have a Derby Day experience anyway. You know, so they shouldn't be uh, caught by su uh, surprise there. But, uh, yeah, I just think that we, we need, to, personally speaking, I think we need to improve. And I know the defenders and the, and the goalkeeper and everybody else are getting uh, pelters at the moment. It's their fault. It's not. You attack as a team and you defend as a team. And I just think at the moment, with our two central midfield players and, and Gareth and, and James McCarthy, I think they just need a little bit of help from wide players, you know, whether it be Atsu or Pinar, if he plays, or, or Morales, whoever. They've got to do a defensive job as well. Yeah, it's great to see them going forward, but unfortunately, when you, when you go to places like Anfield and you have to get back, you've got to get back and defend as well. So I think, in general, we have to defend better as a team. How important is big match experience on a derby day. How important will the likes of Tim Howard be and Leighton Baines and Gareth Barry who have played in big matches and have played international football? I think sometimes when you throw kids in, it's time to sink and swim, but, but I, th I think experience-wise, you know what you're in for. And I think the likes of Jags, um, you know, Tim Howard, uh, again, you know, a couple of mistakes, but, you know, he, he's done fantastic since he's signed for us with Manchester United. But you do need them. You know, calm players down, you know, get out there, I mean... You know, Graham will know certain players just want to sit in the corner, be a little bit quiet, or be shouting their mouth off, talking their heads off, and doing different things. But you know, you've all got you've all got to come together on that day. You know, you've got to defend and, and attack together. You've got to battle, and if it is a battle, you've got to go out there and and do it. I hope there's eleven still on the pitch at the end with a blue shirt, and I don't care about Liverpool. Maybe they might get set one sent off. But I just think that first ten, fifteen minutes, we've got to. You, you know, put a, put something down and say, look, we're, we're not just coming here to, to get out of here with a with a nil nil. You know, we 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 can score goals, which we can. Um, and their back four is it doesn't frighten me at all. You know, the the world class play is gone. I don't think um, Sturridge will be playing, and and you know Balotelli for me. Um, I think Jags or whoever plays will, will, will handle them. I mean, we were picking the two main Sharpie on the way in the other night. Um, so it'll be interesting what Roberto does. I, I think hopefully he'll be positive. I hope, we j as I say, we don't just go there and think, you know, let's get out of this place with a nil-nil. I, I, I think we can really have a go at them, and hopefully that first 15 minutes, as I say, we can have a go and unsettle them. I think that the thing, Dan, as well, and everybody knows Roberto and what a lovely man and a quiet man and everything else. I think Duncan might have a part to play on s uh, Saturday and going over. He might be playing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Duncan will have a part to play in the dressing room before. Uh, he'll be going around the lads, geeing them up, you know, just telling them what, what, what's expected of them. So I think Duncan's got a good part to play on Saturday. Also on the sidelines as well, you've only got to look at some of the other officials from the visiting sides. They don't appeal for as much when Duncan's on his feet staring at them. So his very presence, I mean, he, he's probably the only coach in the Premier League who gets his, his name chanted as regularly as the players. It, it, and that, that can be, it can be small margins on Derby Day, can't it? Well, it can be. And as I said before, it's, it's, it's important to have local lads in there, lads at Scouse lads, but you know, Duncan's been down here long enough now and you know, he knows what it's all about. You know, he's experienced loads of them. Now he's uh, experienced them as a coach. Uh, but I'm sure he'll just be fired up. You know, he'll be rubbing his hands, uh, they'll have their training session tomorrow and then he'll be looking forward to, to the Saturday, probably be first to arrive. Uh, and he'll have them pumped up, no doubt about that. I'm gonna ask you both the same question, start with you Ronnie. It was often said in the 70s that when the Merseyside derby came around, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, you don't even need a football. <laughs> yeah, after 15 minutes, throw a ball on. Um, I, th I think what it was, Dan, and I think uh, both sides are local kids. You know, you know what I mean? You know, we grew up, and I could rattle them off, uh, you know, from Lionsy, Terry Dallicott, myself, Mick Buckley, you know, um, came through the ranks with me. And there were so many Liverpool lads there. Yeah, you just didn't want to lose. And as I said before, it's not just for yourself, you know, you... You, you, you've got a pride in yourself playing, but it's for your mum, your dad, your granddad, your brothers, your sisters, and, and everyone who knows you. And I think when you get out there, it, again, it's going back to, you know, we're in this together. You know, uh, if, if you know we go a goal behind, so what? Uh, you know, we, we can still battle away. And I think uh, in our day, it was, well, well, you could tackle in our day. 
I mean, as I said, was, was, you know, anyone who played in our day, Sharp, you're thinking they've scored maybe 300, and I think, uh, you know, myself today, I'd love to have played today. You know, you don't get Tommy Smith kicking you and a few others, but I mean, it, it's something where, you, you know, that's where you're saying um, everything's there to get under the ball and, and, and have a little bit. You know, everyone says about bottle, but it's, it's not the ones who, who do the kicking, it's the ones who are getting kicked. You know, give us the ball and I'll take it on again. If you kick me again, I'll do it again. And that's where we've got to show you know, on Saturday, because it will be a bear pit, I, I'll tell you now, you know, you know, we say about Goodison and uh, you go there, some of the shouting you get is, is honestly, you, you know, uh, me and Shabby are church goes, you know, but, uh, but we're, the, the we are live, don't forget. But yeah, but the stick we get um, two hours before kickoff, and you feel like saying the pair of us haven't got a pair of boots on, but, but that that's Derby Day. But as I say, play, be, be aggressive in a way where give me the ball, I'll, I'll show these. And as I say, I, I think Roberto. Uh, it had been here by last year, a, as well as some of the players. And again, let, let, you know, let's put it right, but we've got the ability and the quality there to do it. And uh, just hopefully Saturday it'll come off. Weren't wingers overprotected in your day, Ronnie? Uh, well, I used to go out with cricket pads on. <laughs> but it was... Um, no, but it, it, it's tackling. I mean, I, mean I, I go on about it now. If, if you, you know, you can't play football now with the, the surfaces, the balls, the, you know, the, the, the referee. You, you, know, you breathe on, on uh, somebody too heavy they fall over it's a yellow card but y you know tackling in as i say going back to the 70s is is, uh, is something where you know i think they've got a derby um picture haven't they with them um, with lines here and then um, you, you've got graham soonest I, I think he was running away you know what i mean but you know that that's part of it but as i say rules have changed a lot but um y you know you'd have to be brave but you know hopefully we'll be brave on saturday and uh, get that win same in the 80s wasn't it Give it 15, 20 minutes and then chuck a football on and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. The first thing they were said is make sure you win your first tackle. Nowadays, if you do that, you end up with a yellow card. Uh, and all you used to always say to the ref about the referees is show a little bit of common sense. It's a derby game. You know what's at stake. It's going to be fiery. Uh, but nowadays, it, w it was the same. When you're up against players at like Soonis and Case uh, who could look after themselves, even Dalgleish to a certain extent. When we played Liverpool, you know, it we got to a stage where, we, especially when Andy Gray and I were, were playing up front, that Alan Hansen and Mark Lawson hated it because it was aerial, aerial challenges, you know, and they didn't want to do that. They wanted to get the ball down and play and look good and nice and, and pretty, whereas you had two jocks up front, you know, who just wanted to smash and batter centre-backs, uh, and that's what happened. So they didn't like that. So we've got to make it as difficult as we possibly can. I know football's changed. It has changed. But I think after the, the disappointment last year, I think, Roberto and the boys were wanting to play them again in the cup when with the, the cup draw. Uh, they were they were anxious to get Liverpool again. I was like, why do you want to do that? You've just been beaten. And they were th they were saying, no, we know the mistakes we made. We knew where we went wrong. We want to go back and put it right. That was very brave of them. Hopefully they can do the same this year. Because uh, last year, I think at one stage, I was really worried. At 4-0, I'm looking at the clock and there's 25 minutes to go and I'm thinking, oh my God, let's take this and get out of here. So... Hopefully it will be closer this year uh, and we can put put a little bit of pressure on them. I think a few people felt that, Ronnie, didn't they? We won't dwell too much on the derby at Anfield last year, but when it got to 4-0 and they get a penalty and Sturridge steps up, you think, for the first time in your life, you're thinking, God, I hope we get beat 4-0 here because this, could, this could get worse. No, you're right. I, you're looking record books. And I mean, when, when you come and say, now I never swore on the radio, it was beyond me, but it, it, it happens, Dan. And as you've said, uh, you know, if teams are clinical and it's not your day and... You know, it's your, you know, your, your real arch rivals. It, it's, it, it was, you know, sort of you're sitting there watching it. You know, for the players, it must have been, you know, absolutely horrendous. And when you've come off, you know, as you say, you're sort of saying, well, I'm glad it was just a 4-0. And, and, you know, you wouldn't say that in a million years, but that's the way it was. And certain things like that, I don't think you've got to do a team talk tomorrow. I think you've got to turn around and say, come on, let, let's, let, you know, get the season started, really. You know, we all thought maybe we've turned the corner against West Brom and then, you know, the next game, and then you think, you know, the Wolfsburg one was fabulous, especially first half, and you thought, well, we're, we're back to it. But you get these setbacks, and, you know, wh what a better way or, or a bigger game to do in, in, in a derby game. And as I say, Saturday, y you know, the, the lads, are, I, well, I'll you know, I think they'll put it right. I really do. I, I, I know um, a few people, and maybe the pundits um, that, that don't live here might be saying, uh, I think in Liverpool and send them over. But I, th I think we'll go there and surprise them. Well, certainly do you want... Let's take you back to October 1976, Ronnie. Everton versus Liverpool at Anfield. You're making your Merseyside derby debut. And as a lifelong Evertonian, it's probably, even now, difficult for you to describe how you felt. But it must have been a fantastic day 
for all your family as well because they're all they're all massive blues as well. Yeah, it's, it, as I say, the build up and y you know the the big thing for me is is when you're there to chant. You know, you've got you know to get to the. Ground. We we arrive there. You're in a you know a, a strange dressing room. You've got it where. Um, you know, you can still hear the crowd outside, and, and, and people are talking to you. But you're thinking, you know, just let's get out there, and then it's those steps down, and then the steps up, and then you come out, and then you know the cops are, uh, you know, a real noise. But when you look to your left hand side, you've got maybe twenty thousand blue noses. You know, you just think, you know, that, that that's decent, that isn't it? You know, we, we've got to try and put a show on. I'm against him to show, but we lost the game three one. I was lucky to play one on for Dobbo, but some goal wasn't it from Martin? Dobbo? Yeah, fabulous. From distance, oh, they meant the pass. I um, think it, I think it was the weight of the pass that made it. To be yeah, honest, yeah, d double rifled one in for about twenty five yards. But again, Darren, you know, you you go off the pitch really disappointed. I mean, I mean, every defeat, you, you know, you you don't want to remember it to be honest. But you're thinking, well, the next time we've got to put it right. But uh, to go out there, I, I I don't think anybody, um, you know, making your debut will ever forget it. And I think, uh, as you say, with me being a local local lad, um, it's one of my ambitions, obviously, to play for Everton, and I did do it. Very shortly, I'll ask you about the Clive Thomas game. So I'll give you, I'll give you ten minutes to ten minutes to compose yourself, and I'll remind you once again that we are on live. Um, Sharpie, your derby memories. We've got to start with 1984. You and I have done countless question and answer sessions, and and this goal gets further and further out every time we speak about it. So, talk talk us through it. I think it's up to, it's up to about 40 yards out now. It started at 25, and the rest, and then it's gone up. But no, that that was a difficult. This is very similar to where the lads find themselves just now. Just now. And we hadn't won over at Anfield for like 13, 14 years. Uh, but we, we felt within ourselves that we were, we were getting closer to be a team. Uh, we thought we could challenge Liverpool, as I said before. When, when we went over, they probably had a little bit of an inferiority complex. Uh, but this time we knew, listen, we were, we were a match for them. Let's go over and try and win the game. And, of, of course, everybody will remember the goal. But the most important thing was that we won. You know, And it gave us a confidence. came away from there. We went on a run, uh, we went on and won the league that year. So it was important to go over that psychological barrier. We could say, hey, we're as good as them. We can we can challenge them. It's not a problem now. Uh, and that was just a combination of, of our bringing in more experienced lads and likes of Peter Reid and Andy Gray. We had a young team at the time and they just came in and gave us that little bit of experience uh, and know-how. And we just, we just kicked on from there. But the goal itself, you know, we'd love to say it was a lovely ball from Gary Stevens, but... I think it was a hopeful punt up the park uh, that I managed to get a hold of. My, my touch was was decent out my feet, and it was it just the, one of those things that Liverpool at the time played with these Adidas Tango balls. I think everybody else in the league played with, with Mitre balls. So the week previously, Howard had got like a sack full of Tango balls in to Belfield to train with. Uh, so we were training with them, and they were light. They're probably like the balls are now, but they were. Not moving all over the place. So we knew in training what them and hit them well, they would fly. So when the ball sat up for me I thought, well why not? You know, and I just hit it perfectly, the dip and volley and uh fortunately enough Bruce was off his line. I never asked him to do that by the way. Uh no money was exchanged. Uh he was off his his line and you know it was fortune for me it went in. But you know what the most important thing, yeah we celebrated, but the most important thing we celebrated a victory. You know, it wasn't about the goal. The goal could have been a scrappy one from, from two yards, but it still accounted. It, still be, it would still have meant the same. It gave us the belief to go on to bigger and better things. We always talk about how we've got a lack of celebrity fans. There aren't many celebrities that come and watch Everton. But when you talk about celebrity fans, the boy in the brown duffel coat with the glasses, who I'm sure everybody remembers, who goes absolutely berserk. And I know at least half a dozen oh. people have come up to you and, and, and promised you, it's yeah. me. Incredible, you know, and uh, everybody talks about the goal, but they also talk about this little fella in the parker running across with the glasses. And I've been introduced to, I've been introduced to him three times, and funnily enough, it's been a different guy each time. Uh, the first time was in a in a snooker hall in Walton, the Stall Mine Club, and I went in there with a friend of mine playing a few games of snooker, and the lad said, "Would you mind go over the corner and speak to this guy? He's very shy, you know, doesn't want to come up and." Uh, come up to you and I said, yeah, no problem. I says, went over, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. I said, who is he? He says, he's the fella that ran on with the park and the glasses. I said, oh, was he? I said, no wonder he's embarrassed. So I went over and had a word with him and he told me who he was, blah, blah, blah. The next thing, I, I moved over uh, to my house in North Wales and I had a window cleaner who claimed it was him. Uh, and then finally last year, 
we're on our way down to one of the London games and I was getting the train from Chester and uh, the fella came up to me on the, on the platform and said he was the one, he was the man in the parka. So somebody's making a few bob from it, it certainly isn't me. But uh, no, that was all part and parcel of that. And they, they enjoyed themselves. And Ronnie was talking about uh, Evertonians all over the place. That day, I'll, I'll never forget it, Evertonians all over the place, but there was a massive support actually in the cop on the top right hand side of the cop and when the score you saw the blue in the cop it was fantastic there always used to be evertonians in the cop and i watched many a derby myself from the cop end yeah but if you, if you look down this ah, john used to go in the cop i mean ah, john's ah, case. um no but but that was part again of it because you used to say look at them in there the, you know you'd have little pockets in the cop jumping up with, with the goals but again where they used to get the tickets from is beyond me you know what I mean? It's uh, you, you always get an Evertonian in somewhere, but um, you know uh, it just adds to it. I, I mean, you know stories, and uh, as I say, you, you have to say to them to bring the parker to prove it, who, who they are. But we were talking about a, a lad Eddie Cavana uh, about it, where Eddie wouldn't go to Anfield because he, he just said I wouldn't put me, you know, my foot over that ground. And in all the years he followed Everton, he never went to Anfield. So you know, I never, I never had tomatoes, and, that, and that's a true story. <laughs> For any of you younger ones, Eddie Cavana was the guy that ran on the pitch at Wembley in 1966 when we beat Sheffield Wednesday in the FA Cup final. And it took about six coppers to drag him down, didn't it? Are you ready to talk about Clive Thomas, Ronnie? Deep breaths, come on. You'll have to... You'll have to Bear okay. with me. Again, yeah. I'll just, for, the, for any of the youngsters in the room, the name Clive Thomas will strike absolute dread into the older ones amongst us. It was an FA Cup semi-final against Liverpool. It was 2-2. We'd outplayed them. Ronnie crossed it from the left-hand side. It came off Brian Hamilton, went into the back of the net. Nobody appealed, and Clive Thomas disallowed it. And he's been absolutely reviled <laughs> ever since. We still don't know why, Ronnie, do we? Well, well, he's actually admitted he made a mistake now, which we all knew at the time. But I always think, um, you know, when people say to you, you know, after all this time, have you ever forgot it? But especially when you're playing Liverpool, it's the semi-final of an FA Cup. And at that time, you, you know, they were, they were a good side. Um, it was over, um, and as you said, Darren, we absolutely, you know, battered them that day. It should have been even more, but to go in, the usual thing of Liverpool losing, his, you know, back four, and when used to just put his hand up automatically, but you just see the faces, Clement Smith n never did anything, so we knew we jogging back to the goal next minute, it's, it's offside, and then he's finally admitted it. I did have made a mistake there, but it's thirty odd years too late for me. Uh, we don't already beat Man United in the League Cup three nil, so Man United actually beat Liverpool. Uh, sorry. Yet in the final, so you know, th there was no fear if, if we actually beat Liverpool, but you know, it, it, it still wrangles with me. And, uh, and again, it was a, a settled mistake by I think an egotistical referee. You know, um, go back to maybe the, the Brazilian game when uh, the lad took a corner, and well, he didn't go on about it, but uh, you know, I still he never gets a Christmas card off me, never. And our special guest tonight, Mr. Clive Thomas, <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't, he wouldn't dare, would he? Uh, we have got two more guests to introduce you, by the way. Uh, please welcome Ian Snowden and Lee Carsley. Make ball for Marcus Ben Cahill gets back to his feet, Leon Osman. Back out to Lee Carsley! Well, he's deserved that. Every ounce of that he's deserved because he's had a fantastic game. Thanks for popping in, Snods. Is this working? I've been stood there for about half an hour. I've had four bottles of Chang <laughs> waiting for you to finish. He's phoned me earlier on and said, it's quarter to eight this starts. I went, no, it's quarter to seven. He said, I'm in the house. I says, you better get your backside over here quick. Yeah, so I've got a rush on. I've been stood there 20 minutes, listen to your goal that's got to 40 yards out. We're just outside 18 yard box, by the way. Welcome, Lee Carsley. Hey, we've already, uh, we've just seen your goal. Back in 2004, and I know you do a uh, little bit of the afternoon speaking now. You get Evertonians coming up to you, and that must be the main topic of conversation. Definitely, yeah. I think it's um, obviously I didn't, I didn't probably didn't realise the impact it would have um, at the time, um, and obviously I'm something that I'm really proud of. The fact that you know, um, obviously representing the club for eight years as well. Um, went on to play for Birmingham City Coventry after I was at um, Derby and. Blackburn before, but obviously everyone associates me with Everton, and like I've said before, that's something that I'm proud of. Again, we were talking before about what it must be like to score in the Merseyside derby, what the atmosphere is like. That that whole day was just was just terrific, and we were on a roll, weren't we, at the time? 
We were, yeah, we were on a um, fantastic run of games. I mean, it was, it was, um, it was bittersweet really for me because I'm really good friends with Chris Kirkland. So when obviously he was a Liverpool goalie at the time, so, and um, on the on the Monday after the derby, he um, he rang us up and said, "You fancy going for a bit of dinner?" So when I was out, like I was absolutely buzzing, but I had to sort of hide it because he, you could see that he was gutted. And obviously, I don't think he played again after that, so I absolutely killed him. Yeah. Nothing like ending your friend's career, is there? I, re I remember Liverpool that day. They had they had Cinema Pongoli and Neil Mellor up front. Yeah. It was as if they weren't really taking it seriously, but uh, they soon found out about it. It was Rafa Benitez, wasn't it? That was right. Yeah, I think it's um, uh, and he was he was quoted after the well not after the game, but a few months later saying he probably didn't realise the the magnitude of the game and probably underestimated the intensity of English football. And I think he um, you know he, he learned that day a big lesson. We were talking before, Snods, and, and you and I have spoken about it before, about not having any need for the ball for the first 10 or 15 minutes or so. You used to love all that, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Um, I remember the first derby I played in, Peter Reid came up to me and he said, look, lad, he said, just look after yourself. He said, I know you can do, you've got a bit of reputation at Leeds and that. He said, but uh, if the ball's there to be won, go for the player first and then get the ball. So, uh, and I did first, I remember the first 15 minutes, I'd not even kicked the ball. I'd not even touched it. And I run around and I said to the referee, how, how long's gone of this game? And he went, there's about 16 minutes gone. I'm thinking, 16 minutes gone and I've not even touched it yet. And then I got my first kick off Steve McMahon about thigh eye. And I laid there and I was like looking up and I'm thinking, don't show him you're hurt. And Reedy come along and he went, to, you're not hurt, are you? I said, no, I'm not hurt, Reedy. He went, well, get up then. He says, don't let them know you're hurt. Get up and get on with it. But yeah, you've got to you've got to realise that Mersey Derby is is fantastic. I played in in a, in a couple of derbies, Leeds, Bradford, Donny Bradford at a younger age, and uh, I, I used to think, well, they're derbies, and then it went until I actually signed for Everton and played in one, and I sit, listened to the atmosphere going down the steps at both grounds, and then seeing the players how how uptight they were before the game and the shouting before the game, and I thought. Pff, these are what you call a derby, and, and they are the fantastic. Well, I'm not saying the fantastic games, but the fantastic to play in. And uh, I was with a couple of lads last night from the Liverpool lads, uh, Gary Gillespie and um, Ronnie Whelan, and that. And we were all talking about old times in the derby games, and we kicked each other. And it, they, they are the fantastic, but there's a, there's no there's none of that really now. The the kicking I heard Ronnie saying a little bit earlier. There's none of that now. It's all played nicey nicey, but the atmosphere. I'm sure on uh, on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon will be fantastic. And there's only one colour that we want to come out on top, and that's the blue colour. One of the most important men at the weekend, Ronnie, is uh, is Martin Atkinson. That the referee, even now, even though it's uh, it's not as bad as it was in in the 70s and the 80s, the referee during the Merseyside derby, early doors, has surely got to show a little bit of common sense. Well, he's got to, but uh, it, it's the most red card the Premier League so it, you know it, it just shows you um, it, it's still competitive but it, it, as you said I mean you, you know some of the tackles I mean but look at the, even just a normal game shall we say when someone can go over the top I mean I don't think as bad as maybe in our day but someone will kick the ball and get a yellow card where the fella goes over the top he, he, he just does anything to but you know that first 10 15 minutes you, you you've got to win your personal battles before the team can win it you know, a, as a team. So I think, you know, that first 10 minutes, I mean, I can remember, you know, Phil Neville getting sent off. You've got, um, you know, Pina, Van der Meyde, Stevie Gerrard, and I mean, it's tackles where, you know, first 10, 15 minutes, sort of in our day, it was just, you know, get on with it, and no yellow cards were shown. But I think Saturday, because, you know, we're, we're both sides are going in not the best of form. So I think, one th you know, one thing, defences won't want to, you know, let anyone anywhere near that goal. So... A clean sheet for, for either team will be a real bonus, but it, it's something where the referee certainly has, you know, have a word with players, say, you know, you know where you stand with me, you know, any, you know, naughty tackles, uh, I'm, I'm going to be on it, but he must uh, not be pulling yellow cards out first, you know, five minutes for nothing. But uh, I just hope that there is 11 on the pitch, but as I say, it's, it's the attitude of going out there competing in the right possible way and use heads, y you know, you can play with your arms sometimes and, and overdo it, but I, th I think as a team we've got to go out there and and think about it, but the referee certainly has got to play a part. You hope we're not talking about the referee and, and just talk about an Everton, a, a good Everton win. You and I were speaking to Keith Hackett in Thailand during the summer sharpie, and he was reminiscing about his days of refereeing Merseyside derbies, and he was good at it, wasn't he? 
Yeah, it was. The referees in those days were a little bit better. I think they had more of a, a rapport with the players. You know, they'd tell you it straight. If you're having a go at them, they'd have a go back at you. I just think now referees think they become part of the game and it's about them. You know, Clattenburg springs to mind. Uh, I think sometimes the people have come to watch him. And I think, you know, there's not m very many good referees around. Uh, the boy we got the other night at Swansea, uh, should have sent the boy Shelby off if he was doing his job properly. Two yellow cards, but so that's the thing with referees now is inconsistent. You don't know from one week to the next what you're going to get. You know, the players will have their, their favourite referees who they think they can have a rapport with. But I just think at the moment, you know, for, for all the hype and everything else, the Premier League and the players getting better, I think the one thing that, that's not improving is, is the standard of referee. And we hope for a little bit of common sense, but when was the last time you seen that from a referee? I think they're, they're too card happy. They don't see. I know they're, they're getting watched from assessors and everything else, but surely to goodness, you've got to have a, a general understanding of what the game means, the passion and the pride for this, the supporters, the players. Personally speaking, Mark Holtz, he was the last one for me who had a rapport with the players, who could tell the players where to go, and the players respected him. Uh, but I don't think there's an awful lot of respect between referees and players now. And, I, and until that changes, I think we're still going to see uh, ineptitude from the from the officials. But don't you don't you think the assessor's got a lot, Graham, to do with it? You, you know, Riley's the top man, and as you've just said, then Shelby should have got four yellow cards. You know, if you play by the book, he took the shit around how many times, brought them down, you're thinking, he's got to give it. And as I say, as an ex-professional, you don't want to be seeing cards, you know, they stop you and say, well, if it's consistency, he should have been sent off. So if it happens on Saturday, you, you know, if, if he does it and plays by the book, and then the next minute, you, you know, you think, well, he's let that one go, well, when's it ever going to do it? But I, as I say, I think that, the, the, you know, the, the assessor's got a lot to answer if he... Don't if get he me wrong, yeah, it. Ron, you're right, don't get me wrong, I think they've got a really tough job, a really tough job referees and... and and they're, they're everything's highlighted three, four, five times. I can understand that. But I just think it's a manner at times and, and the, the rapport with the players uh, is not great. And it's not about them. It's about the public want to see good football, well refereed. And I just don't think they are at the moment. You've got to have a bit of banter with the referee, haven't you, Cars? There's got to be a little bit of interaction between the players and the referee. When a referee would tell you where to go and say, come on, Cars, I'll get on with it. Yeah, I think it's it's changed though now, nowadays. To be honest, I think the the, the referees are in in a lot of games are, are stars of the show in some respect. They're they're um, they're well known. Uh, they're on telly a lot. Um, I think the lucky thing about maybe um, this the game on Saturday is that I don't think either team have got the kind of players where it, he's, the referee's going to have a, a problem. I think they're uh, they both both teams play football. There's not really a, any physical players in either team, and I think judging from the derbies last season, you know, I, I'm not sure how many yellow cards there were, or, or I don't think there was a sending off either. So, I don't think um, the referee the, the weekend is going to be a problem. But I definitely, towards the end of my career, noticed a, a difference with the the referees and, and like you say now, um, the with the with them being professional and them being fitter and all the all the rest of it. Um, I think it's a tough job, like being a referee. I mean, where I where I work at the minute, we're in the same um, offices as the Premier League referees. So the the scrutiny that they're under from their own assessors, I think they are under a lot of pressure and I, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Whereas, you know, they're, they're getting pulled up for the, the slightest mistakes, whereas um, probably even um, there's no common sense. They're not allowed to use the common sense. It's, it's a literally follow the, the game by the rules. And um, like I say, Mark Elsie was probably, like Sharpie says, the best one at it because he would, he would give you a bit of stick and um, he understood the players, he understood the, the, the manner of a derby, he understood that that's what the fans wanted to see as well, they wanted to see passion and pride and I think um, it's probably something that, um, it's probably only getting worse to be honest, I think if uh, you, you bring in video refereeing as well and, and, and replays and all this and it's, it's not going to do the game any good I don't think. I think what sums it up as well is that I speak to yourself quite a lot, the likes of Kevin Kilbane and Stubbsy and Davey Weir and what have you and, and people go down different routes after football to coaching or working in academies or the media. No one ever says they fancy being a referee, do they? No, I mean, I, th I think at one point, um, I, I, when may maybe about, about six, seven years ago, there was a there was a bit of a, th a thing with the with the football league and the Premier League trying to get ex players uh, down that route. But I mean, um, you know, as a coach, I've, I've refereed a, a five a side game, and it's I'm a horrendous referee. <laughs> get so much stick off the players that you end up arguing with them, and it's uh, it's a tough job to do. And I think it's it's almost like. Um, 
you have to be a certain kind of personality to be a referee. You know, you probably have to be pretty poor at football. Um, you probably weren't very popular at school. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna profile a referee like a serial killer, but I would imagine that they probably like being in charge and they like that authority kind of figure. Almost David Errery, perfect example, headmaster. You could, he, he, I would imagine he was the same in his class and his school the way he was on a pitch. Um, I think he sent me off a couple of times to be fair as well. <laughs> so, um, but no, I think it, it takes a certain kind of person to be a ref. I definitely wouldn't be in that bracket. I mean, we, we've had this conversation before as well. You, you think about who wants to be a referee. And as you say, I agree with you. I think they are failed players and there's nothing wrong with that. But who wants to be a linesman? What are they? They failed referees. I think it's the fourth official that gets more stick than anybody else. He's only stood there having time, but the managers and coaches give him that much stick. But, uh, yeah, the linesman as well. Uh, my pal, who, who's now manager Plymouth, uh, John Sheridan, he was manager at Chesterfield at the time, and he got, uh, he got suspended for six games because the linesman had given two dodgy decisions, and they come running back to the halfway line. Shez got out, and he went, What's your name? And he looked on the program and said, oh, Mr. Robertson, he said, I bet you were one of them kids at school, weren't you, that were useless at everything. He says, and when they were picking teams, you were stood there and go, go on then, we'll have you, Robertson. <laughs> he said, because he, he couldn't do anything, he couldn't, he couldn't play football, but, uh, and he got banned for six games from the, from the football league by it. But, uh, no, it's a thankless job. Um, I know I've, I've had my suspensions and sendings off during my career for arguing at referees, uh, but... I wouldn't fancy that job, and, and none of us here, I, I have no doubt, wouldn't. So, uh, as I say, it's a thankless job. 80 grand a year now, looks nice. I still wouldn't do it, Ron. Uh, That's not, not X's no more. <laughs> but it's a tough job, uh, even being the fourth official, I wouldn't even fancy that. So, uh, no, let them be it. What about the times we've walked out of stadiums afterwards and we've seen the referee and the linesman autographing programmes? First one I saw doing that was uh, Uriah Rennie thought, oh my God, where are we going now? He was actually signing before the game. And I thought, no, we're in, we're in trouble now. You know, and that's, that's when they started becoming stars of the Premier League. Uh, the funniest thing for me is when we get to the game early and I watch them warming up. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> if need to get to the game early just to see the officials warming up. It's a comedy routine. Absolutely hopeless. But I think it started with Graham Paul, didn't it? He, 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 had, you know, he ended up referees having agents. It's just, you know, as you said, well, what are they signing autographs for? You, you know, so again, you know, where's it gone with what a good match the referee had because you can't remember them? Now it's gelled back here. And, well, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but you're looking at the referees, and, and as you said, they're coming in. Well, he had leathers as well, didn't he? Um, you are, Renny. He had the motorbike, the leathers on, the Harley Davidson, and you're thinking, what's, it, what's going on here? Let's get back to the days of Roger Kirkpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the ale the night before. Well, one particular Everton footballer who used to love the Merseyside derby, still does love the Merseyside derby, we touched on him before, who uh, referees were not too keen on, particularly your mate David Ellery after Duncan called him a certain name that I won't say because we're live on EvertonFC.com, by the way. It was Duncan Ferguson. He was always up for the Merseyside derby, and we've got a, we've got a montage here on the screens of some of Big Duncan's finest Merseyside derby moments.
He certainly liked playing against Liverpool, didn't he, the big fella? What, what was he like in the dressing room before a Merseyside derby? Because was he was he just nice and quiet? Because he's a shy boy, isn't he? Or was he? Yeah, he is. He is quiet. He's a quiet lad. Um, I think um, the derbies is when he used to come into his own. I think he's, he was he was always passionate before games. He was a, uh, when I joined the club, he was captain, so he was a, he's a leader. Um, he's a lot better player than what I thought he was playing against him when I seen him at close quarters and I've spent a lot of time with him. Uh, really good player, underrated. And, I mean, a lot of the, the, the montage there of him, of, you know, he's a striker, but you show him clips of him pushing people over and tackling and stuff like that. And he could do that, but he was a very good player. He scored a lot of goals. Um, but he, as a captain, he felt responsible for the club completely. It was, you know, if he lost, he, he, he took it personally. And, um, you know, the, the passion and the commitment that he had to Everton, and still has, to be fair, um, is, is something that you find find hard to, to buy, especially I think it's, um, you know, it was, it was a privilege to play with him, you know, I've, I've done the, um, do my pro licence with him up in Scotland, so um, he's actually my roommate and he's not a great roommate to be honest because he doesn't sleep, he doesn't stop talking for someone that's shy, he don't shut up, um, great lad, great captain, um, you know, I remember he, he played with terrible injuries, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd force himself to play his body, I mean, six foot whatever, um, his body used to break down all the time, but he'd, he'd get off the treatment table, especially for the derbies. Um, you know, and like I say, he was a pleasure to play with. You can't have too many characters in a dressing room on derby day, can you, Sharpie? And, and you want people who are going to put their bodies on the line and go through the pain barrier and go the extra mile for the team against Liverpool. Well, of course, that's what he said and, and what Ronnie said at the beginning about, you know, everybody has to be up for it. Uh, if you're not up for it, I think there's something wrong with you. You know, it's one of the biggest games of the season. Uh, and you might be a foreigner kind of thing, but you'll be you'll be aware and made aware, you know, by the people in the dressing room. Uh, not necessarily big characters. I think you, in one of the clips here, you saw John Ebro, and John was a co one of the quietest guys in the, in the world. But when he went out and played, he he, he played, you know, gave a hundred percent, whether it was against Wigan or Liverpool. So you know, it's it's always there. You know, as, as Carl said about Duncan, in our time, you know, it was a case, and Ronnie would be the same, and Snodge would be the same. We look forward to these games. It was a case of rolling up your sleeves and giving it a right go because you knew what depended on it. You knew, okay, at the end of the day, it's only three points, but it's not that. It's it's the bragging rights. It's the fact of going out, uh, having a meal at night or whatever. When you get beat, it's a case you were told, don't go out of the house. Make sure you go straight back to the house. Don't be seen out in public. So everybody knew how much it meant, you know, to, to not just the players, but to the supporters and the way of life and uh, people in Merseyside. So... It's a big, big ask, you know, and I think we, we we talked about foreign players before, and they might not get it, but I think they'll be the bigger characters in the dressing room, the dunks of this world, and I think, as I said, I think everybody who'll play for us on on Saturday will have experienced this before, so they'll be made well aware with the kit man, with the, the uh, Sagey and and Jimmy Comer and people like that all around the ground, all around all around Finch Farm, how much it means to everybody. Did you did you ever did you ever play in these? This is this is to everyone. Did you ever play in these games and you you could sense in the tunnel that some of the lads were weren't up for it, that weren't they they just literally couldn't handle it. I, I thought I was just seeing cars before you come on. I think early doors, not necessarily up not up for it. I think early doors we the team more than the inferiority complex just didn't believe that we could go out and win it. But certainly when we were, when we were becoming successful. No, I don't think it was anybody not up for it. I think they they knew the pressure of it and everything else, and they had to be up for it. We, we didn't really have anyone. You know, you could go through our team and say Kevin Sheedy. Now you knew Sheeds was never going to go in ninety nine point nine percent for a fifty fifty ball with anybody, but Sheed was up for it, and he would he would make sure that if there was a tackle there, he'd go and get it. He'd go over, and, and I remember one with Steve, Steve McMahon. McMahon. Yeah, he done Steve McMahon. So. Inside, everybody knew they had to do their job and they had to roll the sleeves up. And I'd honestly say I don't think we'd we need any. We didn't really fancy it. I think it's going back to fun of us, guys. Yeah. I, I think again, like yourself and Snods, although you you wasn't born here, you know you know derby games, you know what it's about. You, you know your heart and soul, and, and and you just know you've got to go out there. You know I, when I played Nollins, uh, our derby game was against Feyenoord when I played with FC Denag and Mac Bray. There was was Willem Tway, but the tackling w was was nowhere like it's over here. You know what I mean? And, and again, you know, uh, do you remember the John Ebro once? Stevie Mack tried to do John Ebro and he came off worse. 
And, uh, you know, you get a bit of pride. And as you say, John wasn't a, you know, a, a mouthpiece going on. He just got on with his job. But they're the characters you want, isn't it? You know, as soon as you get on the park, you think, you know, anything kicks off, we're, we're in it together. Yeah, the feeling in the dressing room when you've won a game, like, is, is fantastic. You go back in the dressing room and the lads are absolutely buzzing. Everybody's buzzing. But I just used to stand around for about 20 seconds before you had to run off and just see the Evertonians, what it means to them when you do win, whether it's either at Anfield or at Goodison. And it's unbelievable to see the different characters running on the pitch and dancing around in the stands. And, and yeah, it's great as a player that you beat Liverpool, but I think you, you're more than happy for, for the Evertonians more than anything, Dad. And there's a, there's a chance, cause there's a chance for somebody on Saturday to make himself a lifelong Evertonian idol. You weren't renowned as a great goal scorer, with all due respect, which you'll, say, that far. Which you'll say yourself, certainly not, certainly not from distance, but the likes of yourself and, and Dan Gosling as well, and Wayne Clark is always very well remembered by Evertonians. It's, it's a chance, isn't it, for someone to to become a legend. Definitely, yeah. I think I think you know when you when you you go into the game, I don't think players will be thinking like that. I think it's you know it's um, more about the result. Um, you know, I'm really looking forward to. That. I know I've, I've joined Twitter recently, so I've been getting a lot of tweets from. I know uh, my, well, my, my daughter put me on it, so I'm on it now anyway. So um, so I've been getting a lot of tweets off Evertonians, and it's it's um, I've, I've found it weird how quickly it's turned from you know we'll, we'll never beat Liverpool now and it's the, our season's gone and all this um, you know the, the players will be well up for it on, on Saturday you can guarantee that the fans demand it and um, you know it, like you say it's a chance for, um, for for someone to you know like, like I say make a real name for themselves and I think um, you know I always remember under under David Moyes he'd always roll out for the for the derbies he'd roll out the ones that he could depend on not necessarily the best top players not necessarily the best team but the ones that he knew that weren't going to let him down. And I think, um, especially at Anfield last season, we struggled with that. We It was too much for some players. Um, we conceded a couple of goals quite early doors, and it was a, it was a non-event, and it weren't like a derby. It has to, we have to, and like I say, I'm not, I'm not sure if we've got the kind of players that can turn it into a scrap. I was just going to ask that, this question to us, have we got enough players that are, I'm not saying determined characters, but can roll the sleeves up in our team that... Uh, Hopefully on Saturday and say right. Well, I think we've got Barry, we've got McCarthy. I go to war with McCarthy. Yeah, with that. So, down, so there's two in midfield. Yeah. Seamus Coleman will play. Leighton Baines will play. Jags will play. I think Distan will play. Y you know, well, I'll, what was that? We might. <laughs> I'm not so picking the team. I know what I'm <laughs> saying. I, 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 I think I Ronnie's think playing seven at the back. I think there's enough battle. In Ronnie, I would like know, to think that they could all roll the sleeves up for this game, dear me. If they can't, then oh yeah, no. But well, I think Sharpie said before, uh, Snod's over um, the two wide plays. You know, you need Morales to come mm. really play because again, on the ball and going forward, no problem whatsoever. I don't want to redress Pina, but the two wide plays are going to be really important. But I think Barry and uh, McCarthy, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, you know, against their midfield and back four. But as I say, I, I just think. Um, you know, we could surprise them. I mean, I mean, Roberto, as I say, he's positive and says, look, their back four is, is having a, a really poor season and our strength is going forward this season. You know, usually we're, we're, we're different class and we can keep clean sheets, but we just haven't been able to do it. Uh, only the West Brom game. So, you know, let's go there on the front foot instead of just saying, well, let's have a look at them for 20 minutes and see how the game goes. Well, that's, that's why our front four are important on both sides. You know, where they can they defend when they have to and then Spring forward. I think we've been disappointing. I think the other night with the boy Atsu and, and McGeady and Brian Oviedo, which was fantastic to see Brian back, did really well on the night. Uh, and then with Eto and Lukaku, who didn't really shine. So I think in both aspects, I think that front four, whoever it may be, have got to be prominent for us to get a result. I said before about you know the back four and the goalkeeper get the get all the the blame for for losing games, but I think it's a team ethic, a team ethic. Sorry. And I just think that front four, whoever it may be, you know, needs to put in a real shift. It's not all about looking pretty on the ball at times and, and going forward, but you need to get back and help. And Tony Hibbert got a hard time the other night uh, against the, 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 the winger. But I think at times he was left exposed and he didn't get any help from the boy at Sue. So I think if we're going to get a result against Liverpool, we need to be functioned properly defensively and attackingly. Now, it's got to be a perfect game for us. Uh, it's in us. It's, uh, of course it's in us, but you know, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and, and battle for this. Kevin Morales is in good nick, isn't he, Snods? I mean, he you remember a couple of years ago, he, he battered he Liverpool did. in the first half. He Didn't come injured. out for the second half, because mm. he, 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 he was one of the people that got a whack. 
but he had Liverpool on the back foot to really have the bit between his teeth just now. He does, and I'm sure I'm same as all the fans. We love watching a positive, confident Kevin Morales because he's got everything. He, he's starting to work exceptionally hard as well as a wide player. He's getting that in his defensive duties, but I don't want to see him defending all the time, obviously, because his attributes are going forward and getting at the opposition. So uh, I think he's come back from the World Cup and thought, yeah, well, I'm one of the top players here at Everton. And I want to prove that this season. And uh, I hope that, uh, well, I presume he's going to be playing. Uh, no question about it. But I just hope that he goes out there, takes the game to uh, to Liverpool and uh, and shows us what, what he is all about because I'm enjoying watching Kevin Morales at, at this present minute. don't know whether you've done your coupon yet for the weekend, Ronnie, but it could be 6-5 this, couldn't it? <laughs> I think it could, Dan. I think if, um, you know, both back fours are playing the way they have recently. But we've been punished. We, we were going through some of the goals we've let in this year. I mean, individual as we've been... Absolutely, y you know, you know, we, we just can't get away from it. You know, one player can have 89 minutes, different class. We were talking with Sharpie after the diss stand one. We had a little slight disagreement, so you know, but where the cross came in and it ended up hitting the crossbar, and the lads followed up and scored. Yeah, you can go through all the team. It's like the passing the ball around that someone this game is going to make a mistake, and, and that's totally not us. But that's football. You know, you cut in individual mistakes out, and and, and you, you know, you're there. And, and as I say, we'll, we'll score goals without a shadow of a doubt. I don't care who we're playing against, but it's just something that we've got to go there and, and say, look, we've got to keep a clean sheet. Because I think we'll score no two ways about it Saturday, but it's, it's getting that clean sheet and it's being tight, being as a team, and then with Morales, whoever it is, to hit them on the break, wh whatever it is. But first goal is going to be vital, really is. I mean, if we get that first goal, I think we can do it. You'd take a scrappy 1-0 win, Sharpie, wouldn't you? Oh, dear long. Last minute, uh, preferably. But no, it's listen... We talk about it, we talked about it all night, about pride and passion and everything else. The most important thing is, is the result. You know, whether it be 1-0, 2-1, whatever, we'll take anything. Uh, you know, would you take a draw? Probably not. You probably want to go over there and win, you know, just our season. I think we've started slowly, uh, whether that's a hiccup from all the players being away in the World Cup, but everybody's had to deal with that, so it's not just Everton. But... Uh, no, I, th I think we need to kick into gear quick, and I'm just hoping Saturday will be the case. I think the other night was very, very disappointing, and I think the managers and the players were, were made aware of that by the, the, the 1,700 supporters who went down to Swansea. Uh, but I think I think it's possible. As I said, Ronnie said, defensively they're not great. Touch and go, whether uh, Sturridge plays up top. Uh, but we've, we've got to be better as a team than we were last. Simple as that. If we, we can improve in last year, I'm sure we can get a result. I know you watch a lot of Ireland games, because Aidan McGeady is a potential Merseyside derby match winner, isn't he? Yeah, I've seen a lot of Aidan. Um, I played with him um, five, six games So when he was at Celtic. So I've seen, I've, I've seen the best and the worst of Aidan. Um, typical winger. He's either electric or he's awful. And you listen to this, Ronnie. Has. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean he's he's one of them where you know he can be. I mean you, you've s we've seen him in patches, and it's just getting that, trying to find that consistency level. He's got it in him. You know he's shown before. He's done it at Celtic. He's done it at, at that Russian team um, that he was with, uh, playing the Champions League. So you know he's got a good pedigree, and I think it's, um, you know it's it's difficult. The role that he's been asked to play, um, I think going forward is fine, but I think defensively he's struggling. Um, I think I think the the intensity that the that he has to play at is taking some getting used to as well. Um, but he's one of them. He can you know he can he can be like I say he can be very frustrating to watch. Um, and I, th I think as, as fans uh, we're quite quick to judge as well the players. I think we we literally we, we you, you love them one minute and you and you can't stand them the next. And I think um, Kevin Morales is a good example of that as well. He's so outstanding. And then you know. You won't see him for 20, 25 minutes. So it's, um, like I say, it's just finding that consistency level. And I think, like I say, um, going forward, I've got absolutely no problems with us. I think we're e exciting to watch. I think we're we're expansive. We're really attack-minded. It's it's when we lose the ball where we seem to be struggling at the minute. That in that, And I think last season we had that real intensity to get the ball back or to get into shape. And I think uh, whether it's a confidence thing or, or what at the minute, like you say, the little mistakes are getting punished as well. Every time we make a mistake, it seems to be in our net. I mean, you take the, you know, six three at Chelsea. It's, it's, you know, some of them goals and, and the three goals the other night. So, 
it's almost like all the mistakes have been rolled into six games or whatever it is. So, um, but yeah, I understand that. Yeah, wingers are frustrating. Not you, Ronnie. No <laughs> Thanks, Chaz. That I mean, that that is that is the wingers' lot, though, isn't it? No seriousness, Ronnie. You can't beat the fullback every single time. You are gonna you are gonna play in fits and starts, I suppose. I think with Aiden as well as playing in Russia cars, isn't it? Coming back, you, you know, the intensity is just no doubt the way it is here and, and you've got to get back and defend in the way it's changed but I just think sometimes we're so attack minded from full backs you, you know nobody plays like us the two full backs uh, you, you know when you sort of say the best in Britain you, you'd look at them two as a partnership you know great getting forward there uh, you know assist goals they're getting on the score sheet every other week either of them and then w when you've got two players in front of you you know it's going to be hard as Carl said when you lose the ball you know, usually the full backs up there with you, and 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 you get holes then, wh which teams will pick out. And I think that's where Liverpool really capitalised last season. I don't think I think P and R wasn't fit. You, you know, so maybe a couple of selections as well. But I think this, you know, we've got to play with our heads as well. We've got to really think about a formation, and think you know when we do lose the ball, we, we've got to be really compact. You know, don't don't leave uh, whether Balotelli or whoever. You, you know, well pace wise it'll be Sterling Morley, and if Sturridge plays, it, it'd be a different ball game. But I think if, if Sturridge doesn't play, it's just getting, the, as I say, the two hard players to tuck in and say, look, you, you need to help out here, uh, you know, as, as well. And I'm sorry about before as well, I missed John Stones out. So I wasn't picking the team, but I'm just going through it when I thought, hang on, Jags in this stand, so John Stones, just give him a mention. <laughs> you said before, Snoz, there's not a great deal wrong, is there? Statistics don't look good. The league table's not making the best of reading at the moment, but even after the Chelsea game, there were people saying, we played well apart from the six goals. And as mad as it sounds, that's about right. It is. Um, we started against Leicester, and I thought being 1 0 up and 2 1 up would see the game out. We didn't. 2 0 up against Arsenal, 65 minutes. Thought we played exceptionally well. Got dragged back to 2 all, so I couldn't really see that. So I think that certain games, and the Chelsea game that you mentioned, as the 6 3, were a fantastic game, but every time we kept getting within a goal of Chelsea, within five minutes we were we conceded again. Uh, so it's been difficult and it, we have been this season, we've been fantastic going forward but defensively we, we have leaked goals and, and it isn't us, uh, we're not usually like that but I just think that Roberto just sees it, if, if they get three we can get four and sometimes you can't, you can't do that and last season I was in the uh, Anfield Road end, I went to watch the game uh, in the Anfield Road end and I left at half time, I thought I can't stand this, uh, we were three down. <laughs> Behave yourself, Sharpie. Yeah, I, I, uh, I couldn't. You have little faith. I had a little faith, yeah. I went and watched the rest in the pub. But, uh, yeah, 3 0 down. But I just thought that uh, I know it won't be like that on Saturday. I really won't. I think the, the players realise that over the last couple of games against Palace and, and Swansea, we haven't done a self justice. We've not, we've not performed. So this is the game you want. You want the game against Liverpool at Anfield or whether it be at Anfield or Goodison to put it right. And I'm sure on Saturday, the boys will go out in a determined fashion. They'll have the fans roaring them on in the Anfield Road end, I'm sure. Uh, no question about it. And I'm, I'm certain we can get something. If, if it is a draw, I'll take a draw. I'll be happy with a draw, but I want to go there and win the game. Snod's only left early, by the way, because he realised there was only 20 minutes left of the happy hour in the brick. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to miss it. Um, don't let your heart rule your head, Cars, but... Uh, Liverpool Everton, 223rd Merseyside derby, away win. I think it's going to be a tough game. I, th I really do. I think if if you uh, I was offered the draw now, I'd probably take the draw. I think um, coming off the back of the last couple of results, um, you know, I think it's um, similar to Liverpool as well. They're struggling to to find that balance. Like Snod says, at, at times this season we've been outstanding, um, but I'm just still a bit worried about us defensively. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know, I haven't got that confidence that I had last season. Whereas, like, if you're you're two one up at Leicester, you see the game out and you get the win, you get the three points. And um, having said that, I thought the lads were outstanding at West Brom. I thought they've done really well in the um, UEFA Cup as well. So um, they have got it in the locker to 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 play well and grind out results. So, um, but like I say, at the minute, um, you know, I think I think I'd take a draw. But I'd, I'd, I'd ask you this question: Do you do you think that teams are playing differently against us this season? Do you think there's a different um, attitude from, especially at home, because I, I seen a lot of teams last season almost come to Goodison expecting a fight, and 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 us playing football, and now all of a sudden they know they're dropping off and they're quite compact and and quite happy to counter attack. So have you seen that difference? 
you, you, you are, haven't you, Sharpie? Yeah, definitely. It's always going to be the case, cars that, you know, any uh, opposition company good is in 20 minutes, keep it tight, crowd will get on their backs, and then just let go from there. Crystal Palace the other day, uh, even at 1-0, losing 1-0, they never changed. They just sat with the hope that we'll get a set piece, we'll score from there, and the game will turn around, and that's what happened. But I just think that we... I'd like to think that we have learned the mistakes from last year at Anfield, that we'll go there. Whether he, he sets his team out differently to maybe say, Stephen A. Smith, for instance, you go and sit on Gerrard and stop Gerrard playing when he comes deep for the ball, go and stop him. Because we can't go out with the same ideas that we had last year because he actually tore us to pieces playing a set way. So I don't know if Roberto's going to set up differently, but I think we've got to go and impose ourselves allow Gerard to dictate the game from, from the centre-back role. I think we've got to push him on. I'm just trying to think the last team we played Liverpool, they've done the same thing. Aston Villa. Aston Villa, yeah, sorry. So we've got to learn something from that and say, well, OK, fair enough. We went, and we went to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him last year and it didn't work because they found spaces all over the place. We might have to change the way we play. Not necessarily the way we play, but set somebody up to do a different job. And maybe Stephen A. Smith, go and stand on Gerard. Go and, go and run past him when you can, but don't let him spray the ball. Don't let him dictate. So I think he may have to change his tactics. I think last year's as well, Greg, it was um, John Stones played right back, didn't he? And as Carnes was saying, I think it was a bit much for him. And they found out, you know, Steve Gerrard was pinging balls over him. He, he was positional. Uh, it was I felt for one of his goals. Stephen P and I should have played. So I think last year, everything went against us. But this year, hopefully, I don't think uh, with the Palace game, we learned from last season. You know, I thought I thought again. You know, there's times you got to dig in. You know, teams will drop off. Balassi was the same. So hopefully, it, we will then. You know, we'll go there and say, look, we got turned over here last year because we played a certain way. Um, whether John Stones, I don't know whether you know he's going to play centre half or right back. But I think that was massive because it was a big game for the kid. Don't forget, he's only come from Barnsley not long ago. He's still learning his trade. But I think he's he is a good player. He's going to be an absolutely fabulous player. But I think Roberto has just got to get. You know, that across to the lads to say, look, we got turned over because we played a certain way, so change maybe. Just tweak it a little yeah. bit anyway. Away win, Snods? Of course it's an away win. Um, <laughs> Could you be there for 90 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in the tower watching it because I'm doing the show straight after it. So, uh, yeah, I'll not be there, but I'll be nervously watching it with the Saint and kicking the Saint and clipping him out here, and he'll be doing the same to me. But, uh, yeah. It's a tough call. Uh, I think it's vital for them that Sturridge plays and not for us. Uh, a terrific player. He'll cause us problems. Sterling will cause us problems. But somebody uh, mentioned it there. Stephen Naismith has been fantastic for us. And I think Naismith will be really up for this game. He'll get under under the skin. I think he'll get into Gerard uh, Naismith. I think McCarthy will as well. So... Uh, I'm going for at least a point, as I'm confident we can get a point, and if we defend right, we can get all three. Let's hope so. Let's just end the evening's discussion with a few more memories from the past. What was it like, Snods, in, in, in the 80s when a lot of players from both sides lived in Birkdale, Formby, Southport, that area? Did you, did you socialise with the, with the Hansons and the Lawrences and the Dalglishes? Not, not so much the... And well, Kenny won't speak to me because I turned him down anyway, so I, I, I can't go for a drink with him, but... Uh, no, uh, Ronnie Whelan and uh, Steve McMahon. I remember uh, Sharpie won a one derby game. Give the old Steve McMahon the Benny Hill slap on the head. And but after that, a couple of drinks uh, later, um, everything's fine. Yeah, you, you get on with him great after the game. But I was telling somebody today for the 90 minutes, it's hatred. You, you just don't want to speak to him. You don't want to look at him. You just want to go out there and beat him. And if you if you've got a put your body on the line against him, all well and good. But it was different than does in the 80s. You, you used to go in the players' lounge after it had all finished, have a drink, and then if you saw him the next day, you'd go and have a drink and have a talk about the game. They don't do it anymore. They're, they're living in different places, don't see each other. But uh, no, I used, I used to love it. I used to love the uh, the rivalry uh, on the field for 90 minutes. And then I ended up uh, enjoying going out socially with him and talking about it. So, uh, But there's none of that anymore. What about yourself in the 70s, Ronnie? You must have seen Keegan and Toshak in the Grafton. Not in a million years. Not in a million Ronnie years. Ronnie never went there. He, even when he was, anyone Sorry, the glad ray. Anyone <laughs> old enough to remember uglies? Yeah, yeah, I won't tell the missus. Um, 
Tosh Yak and Eminem, we wouldn't even talk to them. There's not, you know, me, Mick Lyons, you know, Terry Darek, or Bruce Rea, and all that. Honestly, not in a million years. Now, Sammy Lee's a good mate. I've, I've known Sammy for a long time, packed him when I was youth coach at Everton. Uh, he was reserve team coach, we used to go out for a. But as a player, honestly, not in a million years. I, I, you know, I don't know what Snods was, maybe again a different era. But we just didn't like them, Darren. And, and, and it hasn't changed. You know what I mean? So, so much so for the friendly derby. Who wants to go in and have a pint with someone you've just been playing against in a derby game? You've got enough Everton mates and Everton supporters you can drink with. I've got to have a chat with you, Snods. <laughs> but uh, not in a million years anyway, no. I mean, when you, when you go back to those, you see the likes of, uh, of Ian Callaghan representing Liverpool Football Club at Labby's funeral and Dave Hickson's funeral. The, the, re the respect's there, isn't it? Yeah, when, when you're finished, you, you know, we've, we've packed in Labby, you know, Labby, as, as you know, uh, felt a lot of, uh, for Labby. I see Callie now. Callie's a cracker. You know, even Tommy Smith talks to me. But, I mean, it, you know, not as players. I mean, you, you know, we're not saying you go around the house and you're best of mates. It was Everton's got one camp and you've got another. And, you know, it was at the time, as I said, the 70s, I, I don't know, remember anyone that had, that had dreamed of it. I, I seriously, I'm not, you, know, you know, it's the truth. And uh, you, you, you look at it, you just think, what would you want to have a pint with them for, Cass? What? You, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, we, as I say, even now, um, it, it, it fires me up. I mean, you know, I know you've got to do it for you because you get paid um, with, with, with Aldo. And I do it with Jimmy Case. But I've known Jimmy Case since he was 16 when he used to play at South Liverpool. So it's a bit different, but again with Jimmy, you know, I'm not phone up saying what are you doing after the match and, and all that. But I know work-wise you've got to do certain things and, and get on with it. But as I say, players-wise, um, I can't remember anybody who's, you know, that socialised. And it's not being nasty, it's just been I, I pick my friends. No, I, th I, think we s I think what Snodge was saying, I think uh, I lived next door to, to, to Ronnie Wheel and I don't think it was a case we'd be arranged to go out for a pint. But if we went out and they were there, I think after the game kind of thing, and... And if Doug Leach and Hanson were out in the restaurant, kind of thing, if it was a case of sending a drink over, or they'd send a drink over, kind of thing. So it wasn't a case of socially going out. You'd bump into them in Southport and you'd say, yeah, hi, kind of thing. But you wouldn't phone them up and say, let's go for a pint. So they probably frequent the same places as we did. There's still a bit of rivalry and a bit of banter at the likes of the golf days, isn't there? Old Liverpool against Old Everton. Yeah, definitely. There's, the lads are good lads now. We, we play golf with, like say, Gary Gillespie, Ronnie Whelan, you know, Jim Beglin. Uh, Kenny and, and that as well, but uh, no, they were, listen, friendly enough off the field, but when it was on the field, you, you kicked seven bells out of them, as simple as that, you wanted to win, whether it was a reserve game in the Central League, or whether it was an FA Cup final, or whatever, you wanted to win, uh, afterwards, yeah, fair enough, you, you said hello, but you didn't, you didn't socialise with them that much. What about yourself, Cars? did you ever go for cocktails with Lauren Cinema Pongoli? <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, never, never went for any cocktails with them. Um, <laughs> The, the, the place where I stayed in town, there was um, Chris Kirkland was in there, um, Stevie Finnan was there, Jimmy Troyori, um, Crouch, Peter Crouch. Um, so they were all in the apartments in, in our same block, but luckily enough, uh, Tommy was in our apartment. So um, when, whenever they'd get in the lift with us, Tommy just stand there like staring at them, <laughs> fucking giving, giving them the, the death stare. So, but no, um, I mean, my, my the, fir the first derby I played in at uh, Anfield, I remember. Um, I'd only been at the club for maybe six, seven games. Walter Smith, one of Walter Smith's last games, and um, I think we drew nil nil or one one. And um, Radzinski scored, didn't he, for us in an Elka equalised for Liverpool? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it's a good guess. <laughs> and um, I remember a couple of the, I think it might have been might have been Radzinski and uh, maybe Pistone. A couple of the lads had swapped shirts with the with the Liverpool shirts, and and the they were on the 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 treatment table. You know, they just throw the shirts on there and. I remember Jimmy Martin picking them up and throwing them out into the into the hallway, <laughs> like they w literally didn't want them in the. <laughs> and it was a bit weird to me because I thought it can't be that bad, surely. But it, as I grew into being an Everton player, I understood that and anything red just weren't allowed. So, um, but no, I didn't. I've done a little bit of socialising with Finney and and Kirky, obviously from Coventry and Stevie Finney from the Irish team. But um, you I definitely noticed a difference in the living in the city centre. The week of the derby, I'd notice a big difference with the, the atmosphere in the town. You could see lead up to it. That was the thing. So did we see about red shots? Car was saying that. I'll never forget uh, Howard Kendall, when, when that first came down, he went to the NBA to have a red car. And I remember one day David Johnson had just signed back from, was it Liverpool he came back to that? Yeah. And he came in in a red BMW. Well, Howard went absolutely ballistic, told him to change it, he wouldn't change it. Needless to say, John didn't last long. 
but it was that intense. You couldn't come in with a red jumper or what you're doing with that one. Uh, red boots nowadays. Yeah, that's right. they, no, you can't have red, so the, the kit man gets permanent mark and, and colours it in black and all that kind of thing. So really, really opposite red. So if anybody's got red in tonight, they're getting thrown Fair out. Enough, yeah. Do you remember we, um, we, we saw in the Egyptian lab? Ibrahim Saeed. Yeah. Do you do you remember when he come into the into the dressing room and he dyed his hair red before the derby? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad move, wasn't it? <laughs> so he was um, he was he was sent home and obviously had his red highlights. But I think I think he he, he learnt that it weren't acceptable. I remember Ibrahim Saeed rooming with Kevin McLeod at away games. Who came up with that? Lord only knows. Um, we'll leave the last word to you, cars. But you mentioned Thomas Gravis in there. I mean, <laughs> I can't imagine what it must be like to get into a lift and have Thomas Gravis and staring at you yeah. in such a confined space. How is he? He's good. Yeah, yeah. We still speak um, every couple of weeks, so he's um, he's doing well for himself. He's 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 happy. Um, doesn't really take much interest in football. Um, lives in Vegas, like I say. So he he spends a lot of time in the outdoors and biking and keeping fit. And so um, yeah, he's he's in, he's in good form. Fantastic footballer, wasn't he? All the lads have said, a lot of the lads from that area say when I do Q&As that uh, in training, he was his, his skill was ridiculous. Yeah, again, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's probably a bit of a myth that he was a, a tough guy and a tough tackler. You know, he was, he'd, he'd do anything he could to get out of a tackle, Thomas. But he was, well, he was by far the best player in our team that season. When he went to Madrid, he was outstanding. He was one of the best players in the Premier League. Um, both at international level and for and for the club, he had a lot of assists, sc scored a lot of important goals, and um, you know he, he weren't right. Like there was some, there was something definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely up with him. But he was a, a great player to play with, and and someone that you know, like like you say before a derby, you, you looked at him in the tunnel and you, you knew that he was going to be up for it. They wanted you, Real Madrid, didn't they? No, there's they there's didn't. truth in that rumor, no, isn't there? Not, and I, th I think it's you know, m me and Thomas have spoke about this. I think it's it's yeah, I hope they'll keep reminding him, but. It's, it's, he's far better. He's an unbelievable player, and the, the skill and and um, it's you know it, it, it takes a bit of the gloss off the fact that he moved. That there's there's people that are saying oh they're after you, but he was absolutely no chance. He's, he was by far, I mean he was he was about two stone heavier than me as well. So he, I, I think they definitely got the right one. <laughs> Magnanimous as ever. Um, we're just about ready to draw a line on it. I just need to mention if anybody is going to the derby, we've been asked to mention one more time. Anybody either watching around the world on EvertonFC.com or here tonight. Everton Football Club, Liverpool Football Club, the council and the police got together this week. There were issues around here last season, we know that, and the advice after the meeting between the four parties is get there early. If you are going to the game, if you have got your £52 ticket for the away end and you're going to watch the Blues at Anfield, do get there early. Uh, my thanks to the legends that are Ian Snowden, Ronnie Goodless, Graeme Sharp and Lee Carsley. Thank you.